Hi, I'm Mario Carnero, and this is a tutorial for the MetaMath Zero language and the MM1 proof assistant. The language borrows heavily from the design of the MetaMath and Lean theorem proving languages, but I won't assume that you have any familiarity with these languages in this video. MetaMath Zero, or MM0 for short, is a specification language, which means that it gives you the tools to rigorously state logical theorems. In fact, it is a so-called logical foundation, which means that you actually get to define the rules of the game. Most people use first-order logic, but it's also possible to define higher-order logic, dependent type theory, modal logic, or even stranger logics, as long as everything can be defined in terms of axioms and rules of inference. And that includes, in a very tactical sense, just about everything you can think of. The file I'm looking at now is the tutorial in the examples directory of the MM0 repo, uh, which is where you can find most of the tooling around MetaMath0. To get started, you'll want the uh, VS Code extension, uh, which you can find on the marketplace by searching for MetaMath0. Uh, um, you'll also want the language server in order to get the red squigglies, which is going to be pretty important because we're basically going to be doing error-driven development while we're writing proofs. Uh, this is a Rust application, so you'll need Rust to compile it. Uh, at some point I'll have uh, ready-made executables for download, but this should just work on every system. Once you have it built, you can just put the uh, MM0RS program on your program on your system path, or you can set the executable path in the VS Code settings. Uh, once you've done all that, uh, you should see the highlighting here, uh, and uh, also, uh, if I type in some nonsense, you can see that I'm getting uh, some squiggles and uh, hovers. So with that, we're ready to go. Okay, so let's create a new file with the MM0 extension. For this example, we'll define propositional logic. There are a couple ways you could do this, but to keep things simple, we'll use a short and simple axiomatization of classical logic by Jan Lukashevitz. First, we define the sort of well-formed formulas like this, and then we can define two term constructors representing implication and negation. And the short arrow here means that implication takes two well-formed formulas and returns a well-formed formula, and not takes one and returns another. Uh, here's the first axiom, um, which says that A implies B implies A. Um, all mathematical notation goes between dollar signs, like in LaTeX. And uh, now it's complaining that it doesn't parse, and the reason is because it thinks that open paren imp is one token, because by default it assumes anything without internal spaces is a token. Uh, we can fix that by doing this, but that gets old quick. So instead, uh, we'll tell it that uh, we don't need spaces around uh, parentheses. Okay. Uh, but now it's complaining that it expected a provable sort and got well-formed formula. What this means is that if we want to be able to state theorems about well-formed formulas, we need to tell it that well-formed formulas are the kinds of things that can be proven, uh, like so. Um, this can be compared to a sort such as a natural numbers, where it really doesn't make sense to say I've proved two. Uh, okay, the red's gone, but now we've got a yellow squiggle. Um, what this means is that the compiler that's running here has inferred the type of the variable, uh, but it's running in a strict mode that doesn't allow variables to be inferred. That's because this language, the MM0 files, is deliberately simple uh, to make it easy to write parsers and alternate verifiers for it. Uh, when we get to the MM1 language, we'll lift this restriction in order to make it easier to produce proofs. For now, we can uh, fix the error by uh, stating the types of the variables like so. Uh, and now it compiles. Um, but this is still kind of not nice because we have uh, we're referring to imp directly here, and uh, you know in a big uh, expression this might not be uh, easy to read. Uh, so let's add uh, some notation for for implication. Uh, the notation for that is uh, so this says that. Uh, implication is a um, right associative binary operator with precedence 25, which is a number I just made up. And by the way, uh, this is a programmer font with ligatures. Uh, this is entirely ASCII text. This is just a hyphen and a uh, greater. Um, 
And so now you can see if I hover over this that it's already using our notation, and I can also write it that way. Okay, uh, so let's finish off the axioms. So axiom two says that if we have a, b, and c, which are well-formed formulas, and a implies b implies c, and a implies c, or b, then a implies c. And axiom three is contraposition, which says that for a and b well-formed formulas, if not a implies not b, then b implies a. And it's complaining about parsing again. Uh, so we need to tell it that uh, you can tokenize between a uh, tilde and the rest of it. Uh, let's space this out. By the way, the two lists of characters here denote whether we split a token ending with this character or beginning with this character. By putting negation in the left list, we can ensure that something like tilde A parses correctly. Uh, we don't want too many things to be delimiters because it limits the kind of multi-character tokens we can use. Uh, of course, it's complaining that we never define the tilde, so let's uh, define that. Um, and we're using prefix because this is a prefix operator with precedence 100, because why not? Um, we have one more axiom to go, and that's modus ponens, uh, which isn't really an axiom, but more an inference rule, but uh, MM0 doesn't really distinguish between those. Um, so it says that if A implies B is derivable and A is derivable, then B is derivable. Um, and by the way, we can also write that like this. Uh, if we want to give useful names to the hypotheses. Um, but it's an axiom, so it doesn't really matter. All right, we've defined classical logic, but presumably math is about more than just axioms. Let's state a theorem that should be provable in classical logic. This is the identity, and it says that A implies A. As you can see, the syntax for this is the same as for axioms, except you use the word theorem instead. Now, if you're familiar with lean, you might notice something odd here. Uh, this file compiles with no errors, but we haven't proven the theorem. Is it so smart that it's figured out the proof on its own? Well, no. Uh, can we even provide the proof? Spoilers, this is the syntax for doing so. But if we ignore the error about this proof being nonsense, you'll notice that it says that theorems should not have proofs. Stepping back a bit, what's going on here is that MM0 is a specification language, not a proof language. It provides a syntax for being able to state assertions, like this theorem follows from those axioms, and verifiers are allowed to use any means necessary to validate this file. In practice, the way to validate a theorem is to be handed a proof, and the MM0C verifier that you can find on the MM0 repo takes an MM0 file like this one and a binary proof file and verifies it. But that begs the question, how do you produce these binary proof files? Uh, certainly no one wants to be writing those by hand. Well, that's where MM1 comes into the picture. Uh, let's make this compile again and go to the next part. So here I haven't done anything to our example from last time, but I've changed the extension, as you can see, from MM0 to MM1. The MM0RS compiler can handle both versions, and it uses the file extension to tell whether this is an MM0 or an MM1 file. Uh, but they have very similar syntax. But notice now that theorem id here is giving a warning, and it says that the proof is missing. Uh, in addition, we get type inference in MM1 mode, so we can remove the variables and it doesn't give an error. Uh, as a matter of style, though, I recommend keeping the variables for axioms and public theorems because this will help ensure that the variables come out in the right order when matching against an MM0 file. There's one other thing we should do to make this actually match against uh, the previous file, which is to mark this theorem as public. Uh, what this means is th that this is a theorem that appears in the corresponding MM0 file. So, for example, you could write an MM0 file containing the axioms in a particular theorem of interest, like the Kepler conjecture or the Riemann hypothesis, and when you're proving the theorem, you might need a whole bunch of lemmas that weren't mentioned. Maybe you even need to invent a whole branch of mathematics just to answer that one question. So all those lemmas are considered local, and you would only have the one main theorem at the end marked as public, and then the verifier will be happy with the result. All right, so that was enough setup. Let's prove our first theorem. To start, we can put equals here, 
and we get a red squiggle on the underscore, and it says that we're expecting proof of A implies A as expected. Okay, so how do we prove this? If you know your combinators, you might know that S, K, K is the identity function, and here S is axiom 2 and K is axiom 1, so a first shot at the proof uses those. We get an error saying too many arguments, and that's because axiom 2 is an axiom, not an inference rule, and it takes no arguments. We have to stick in modus ponens as a sort of application. Okay, this is almost a proof now, uh, but we're getting an error message saying something about question mark A. What's that? If I mouse over this, you can see that the middle message there says that this is proving A implies question mark A implies A. And question mark A is what we in the biz call a meta variable. That is, it's expecting some proposition, but it can't figure out which one we mean. These tend to come up a lot during proofs, but the proof of identity is actually somewhat unusual in that even though we finished the proof, there is an unsolved meta variable, which means that we can use any proposition at all, true or false or A or the Riemann hypothesis, and all of them would result in a correct proof of the identity. Okay, but then how do we supply the proof? If you know lean, you'll be familiar with the at sign, which can provide implicit arguments to a function. Here we can do the same thing, but it's the bang instead because the at sign is used for another meaning. Uh, and now we can see more precisely that uh, it is the second variable in x1 that needs to be filled in. Uh, let's use a since we've got it right here. And now this is a proof. Uh, just to show that we can use something else, we can use not a instead. Uh, we need to use dollar signs here in order to get notation. Um, but if we use something else for the first argument, uh, like not a, uh, we get a unification error, uh, which is to say that compiler was ex expecting us to prove one thing, and we gave it another thing. It says that a implies something does not match not a implies something, because a and not a are not the same thing. Okay, so let's back that out and move on. There's one other feature of MMs here that we haven't talked about, and that's definitions. Let's define AND. In case you forget your truth tables, you can check that this is, in fact, equivalent to conjunction. Now, we're being pretty brief here. Certainly, MM0 wouldn't let us get away with all the inference here, but even MM1 isn't happy with this. It says that dummy variables A and B are unbound. What this means is that it's inferred that we're defining a constant called AND that takes no arguments, it unfolds to something containing A and B, where A and B can be whatever we like. It's an interesting exercise to show that a constant with such a property is inconsistent, so MM1 is rightfully complaining that this is nonsense and we're smacking our heads because we actually wanted A and B to be arguments of the function. Uh, so let's do that. Uh, here we can see type inference kicking in, so we don't have to give any of the types, but if I mouse over you can see that it has correctly inferred that this function takes two well-formed well formulas and gives another one. Let's give this notation too. So we want to say that AND is left associative uh, with precedence 35. Similarly, we can define disjunction. And we're going to give it a slightly lower precedence than uh, and because uh, and should bind more tightly than or. Now let's prove a theorem using one of these definitions, starting with the simplest, which turns out to be the or right rule. Now you might be wondering how you unfold a definition here, and it's pretty similar to lean if you're familiar with that. Uh, basically, uh, you just use a theorem that requires it to be unfolded in order to unify. Uh, in this case, this is really easy, because it turns out that if you unfold OR in this theorem, you get B implies not A implies B, and this is just an instance of axiom 1. So if we stick that in, the proof checks. We can also unfold a definition manually by asserting a type using a type ascription. By saying we have an implication on the right, MM1 was forced to do some unfolding to figure this out, and afterwards it knows that the target is a, a B implies not A implies B. Um, the OR left rule is equivalent to the principle of explosion uh, if A and not A 
uh, than anything. Um, and let's be good citizens and break that out as a separate lemma. Uh, this one's a bit harder than our last one, especially because we haven't proven any of the logical toolbox that we would normally be using in such a situation. In fact, to keep the tutorial moving, I'm going to cheat and use the answer key. And now everything checks. A hollow victory. By the way, you might notice that many of our theorems have hypotheses uh, here. Uh, in MetaMath 0, you can prove inference rules as theorems too. Uh, this is not quite the same as having a, an implication. For example, we have theorem A1i, which is uh, just axiom 1 uh, composed with modus ponens. Um, but uh, axiom 1 implies A1i and not vice versa. Uh, this might be unfamiliar if you have a lean background, but it means that you can't... Uh, it means that we can represent things like modal logics directly, which isn't possible in a general purpose type theory unless you extend the type theory itself, which means changing the verifier. The point here is that the verifier is completely general purpose and doesn't even know what logic you're working in until you give it the rules of the game. Before we move on, we've now got a working MM1 file that proves the MM0 file from the last part. Let's try to compile it and check the proof using the external verifier. Since we didn't define uh, and and or in the previous part, we'll need to mark them as local, which is basically the opposite of pub. Uh, that way, we're saying that these definitions don't need to exist in the mm0 file we're proving. In fact, all of the stuff after theorem it is superfluous, and we could delete it. But the verifier will check the proofs anyway if we put them in the file, so we can make sure it's all working. So far, we've been using the mm0rs program in server mode, uh, which means that it gives live information about the status of a proof. But when we're satisfied with the proof and want to compile it to a binary proof file, we use it as a command line utility. So let's open the console, navigate to the tutorial directory, and run mm0rs compile with the mm1 file that we just wrote and an mmb file that we're going to produce. Uh, it gives some diagnostics about what it's doing, but it's done in no time at all, and it produces an mmb file that you can see here in the Explorer. By the way, Let's make an error just to see what happens. The first part of the message is the non-interactive compiler, which you can use in lieu of the server mode if you prefer command line tools. Uh, if we skip the second argument, that's all we see. The second part of the message here is a rather ignominious crash. Uh, that occurs because the MMB proof export function is expecting a proper proof. Uh, the backend tools have a tendency to have less pleasant error messages, so you shouldn't bother building the proof file unless you're already pretty sure you've got everything working. Um, let's make it work again. And uh, now that we've got a proof file, uh, let's build and run the uh, external verifier MM0C on it. So we'll navigate to the mm0c directory, uh, call gcc on main.c just to produce the executable. Um, and if we run it, just to make sure that it's working, we get a short usage message. Uh, if I navigate back to the tutorial, um, we can call it like this, where we pass it the mmb file as uh, an argument and pipe it the uh, mm0 file from the previous part um, that uh, this m this is supposed to be a proof of. And in roughly zero seconds, it's verified our proof. Now, you can reasonably ask what was the point of the extra steps here, because we seemingly already verified the proof when the red squiggles went away in the server. The difference is that the MM0 proof assistant is a big and complicated piece of machinery, and quite frankly, you really want a proof assistant to be big and complicated because that's the price of the convenient features that are there to make proof writing easy. However, when the goal is to produce a proof, you would like some additional assurance that the, comp the verifier doesn't have any bugs in it because that could compromise the whole enterprise. After all, what is good is a flawed proof.
The solution is to have the proof assistant produce proofs in a simple format that can be checked by a very simple program that can be audited for correctness. In fact, the primary goal of the MM0 language is to have a proof language that is simple enough to formally verify the correctness of the verifiers, but efficient enough to support the mathematical libraries of the future. Anyway, that completes this part. In the next part, we'll look into some of the more advanced features of the proof assistant. Our first new feature is already on the first line. We can import one file into another. MM0 does not have an import mechanism in order to keep the formal specification simple, but this is of course the sort of thing one wants in a formal proof development, so there it is. Uh, MM1 also has a metaprogramming language, which you can enter using the do keyword. As you can see, things execute here as soon as you type them, which should be familiar if you've used lean. Uh, we can define functions and execute them. So here I'll define the factorial of x to say that if x is 0, then 1, otherwise x times factorial of x minus 1. And we can check that the factorial of 100 is, in fact, that number. Uh, this syntax is pretty similar to Lisp, or more specifically, Scheme. Uh, the braces are used to in, denote infix operators, like multiplication here. Um, pno.mm1 has a respectable library of functions that you can borrow for, your, for use in your own files. Here are a couple. Uh, I won't go over all of the details of the syntax here, um, but uh, you can pattern match on expressions using match and matchfn. Uh, there are lists and booleans and strings and so on. Um, for example, uh, let's print out the numbers from uh, 1 to 5. Um, so we have to go one further here because uh, the upper bound is exclusive. Uh, the at sign, by the way, is sugar for a parenthesized expression that goes as far as possible, like that. Uh, it, this turns out to be really useful, especially when chaining long sequences of theorems. And it uh, addresses one of the more common points about uh, Lisp uh, close braces. Another thing we can do using do blocks is to look at a defined theorem. Uh, this is just evaluating the atom absurd, but the server will also display the theorem named absurd if we do this, and we can control click on it to go to the definition. Um, I used alt left to go back. The tick just before the absurd is a single quote, and in Lisp this means to quote the following expression. If we didn't do that, it would complain that there is no variable named absurd. Um, if you noticed, in the previous part, every proof expression started with a tick, and that's because it's actually a quoted S expression. If we don't put the tick, we can actually perform a computation, uh, anything we like, as long as it produces a proof. So for example, this proof of MPD looks a little repetitive. Let's uh, use fold R to build it. And the uh, underscore theorem name means uh, example. So we're going to use fold R here on a list containing h2 and h1 with the axiom 2 at the end and the function to fold is going to apply axiom p to x and y. And the uh, prefix comma here means uh, anti-quotation. Uh, inside the quotes, everything gets interpreted literally, so this would insert a literal x and y. Uh, but we want the variables x and y from this scope here, so that's where anti-quotation comes in useful. If you know lean, this is the double percent operator. Um, but something's not working. Uh, something's not unifying. Um, let's see. Um, Let's see what it's producing. Oh, it's backwards. So I guess we need a fold L. Oh, and now it's working. So um, 
we haven't really golfed the proof much because it's kind of double the length. Uh, but this kind of ad hoc proof programming is a pretty nice way to compress repetitive proofs. For example, if you have to split into cases and the proof in each case is almost the same. Um, there's another way to compress the proof, which is what is used in the piano arithmetic library. Uh, if you recall, we originally tried to, to apply axiom 2 to two arguments directly, and uh, we got an error saying that it doesn't take arguments. Well, that error is actually overridable, and you can uh, add a hook to, to provide a more useful functionality. Um, and so, uh, this is borrowed from PNO, uh, and I won't uh, describe the details of how this works, um, but it's basically a fancier, a more elaborate version of the fold L that we just wrote. Um, and it triggers automatically when you give a function too many arguments, uh, which means that you can, it basically automatically uses modus ponens as necessary, which means that this, uh, which didn't previously check, uh, we can now just apply two arguments to Axiom 2 directly, and it does this automatically. Um, now, if you've used lean, you might be wondering whether everything is in term mode like this or whether there are tactics. Uh, in fact, we've been using a tactic all along, the refine tactic, uh, which gets called by default if you pass an S expression directly to a proof. We can call it directly instead, like this. Um, if we want to call multiple tactics in a row, we use the focus tactic, uh, which is like lean's braces. Um, the error here shows that it's expecting a proof, and if we write a raw S expression here, then it gets called. Uh, we can also make local definitions with have. So that would be something like this. Let's put this back. So we want to say that uh, we can prove A implies A using id for no reason at all. Um, uh, for f our final example, we'll write a tactic that can prove theorems of the form some conjunction of things uh, implies A. Um, so that's like, uh, so here I'm going to borrow a big chunk of uh, the PO library because I want these two theorems uh, that say that we can weaken a conjunction on the left and right. Uh, and the goal is going to be to be able to prove theorems like this, where we're, we have a conjunction of things, and then we want to prove that one of the conjuncts uh, is true. So, like, this implies A or this implies D. Um, the proof strategy is going to be uh, to apply weakening on to go in this. So, uh, if I look at the, the goal, it says, uh, you know, I'm proving this conjunction. If I apply... Um, a weak right, uh, now we're getting closer, weak left, we're getting closer, and we'll finish with identity. Um, so uh, the nicest way to go about writing a script that will just do all of these kind of problems automatically uh, is to use a refine script. So refine in MM1 is uh, quite the Swiss army knife. And when you use a function directly where a proof is where a proof term is expected, it will call the function. So uh, here um, you can see that if I uh, print high, you can see it's calling my print high function um, at this location here. Uh, I got past two arguments. Uh, let's take a look at what they are. And the first one is refine itself, and the second one is the goal that we're um, trying to prove. Um, so you can see it's MDD, while uh, if I were to apply it first thing, uh, the goal is this uh, big conjunction. Um, so, um, yeah, let's, let's write this uh, function. I'll we'll call this refine because that's what it is. Okay, uh, so we generally want to end by applying refine uh, using this type and also uh, with a function that we're going to define by recursion. Uh, we need the we need to destructure the goal 
um, into uh, left and right hand. So this is using a pattern match uh, with implication, and we're getting the left hand side, and we're going to call this function uh, f, which is defined right here. And I'll call it LHS. Um, by the way, it's interesting to note that we're still getting proof hints, even though we're in the middle of writing a tactic. This uh, underscore here is getting the same info as it normally would, because we're passing it to Refine, which knows the actual span of the data. You can even manipulate this information in your own tactics if you want more targeted error messages. But OK, um, so we need to match on the uh, LHS here, which it's either a conjunction or not. So if it's a conjunction, we'll say that the parts are left and right. Um, and then we want to match. So if it is a conjunction, then we have two places to search, right? It's either a conjunction on the left. Uh, the one, the proof that we want is either on the left or on the right. If it's on the left, uh, well, uh, we might not find it. So let's say uh, if it returns undef, then we want to match on the right. Uh, and if that returns undef, then we'll also return undef. If it doesn't, uh, if it returns some results, we'll say that this is the proof, right? So it either returns undef or it returns the proof. Um, and so in this case, uh, we we found that the, the right-hand side did return the result. So we can actually just apply a, uh, weak right uh, with this uh, result that we got. Um, otherwise, suppose that the left branch returned result. In that case, we can call and weak left with the result. OK. Um, we need a base case, though, uh, which is when it's not a conjunction. Uh, in that case, if uh, the left-hand side is equal uh, to the right-hand side, and the double equals here is uh, equality of expressions. I guess I could just. So uh, this, this compares uh, all, all sorts of e expressions, whereas this would only uh, compare uh, numbers. Um, but if they're equal, then we want to return id. If they're not equal, then we want to return undef. And uh, that's just what happens if you use an if with one side. Uh, and, and there's no errors, so apparently our proof worked. Um, let's uh, put this in a function uh, just to make it a little bit cleaner. So we're going to call this uh, conj proof. Uh, and we can just say it's like that. And now we just use conj prove directly. And notice there's no uh, initial tick here because we're actually passing it this function to refine, and then refine is going to call this function, um, and it's going to prove the theorem. And you can see that it did, and it worked because there are no errors. Uh, just to, to keep testing it, you know, let's make sure that it's uh, proving interesting theorems. Uh, can't prove it when there's no D, uh, but if uh, D is on the right, maybe D is in both places, maybe I'm searching for B instead. Um, always check your base case. So this seems to be working. Um, so that's uh, the end of the tutorial, but there are a bunch of other interesting things in the uh, MM1 Prover and in the MM1 project more generally, including a complete programming language compiler written as an MM1 tactic. If you're a Lean user, one reason you might find this language interesting is that the MM1 server we've been playing with now is faster than Lean by more than one order of magnitude, uh, which in particular means that there are no orange bars of death to worry about. 
Uh, the MM0 verifier is even faster. It can check the full Metamath library in a quarter of a second. Uh, and while I haven't tested it on the Mathlib library, it should be in the ballpark of a few seconds to check. Anyway, that's all I have time for today, but if you're watching this as part of the Lean Together meeting, then you can ask questions during the Q&A period on the schedule. And otherwise, feel free to ask questions in the YouTube comments or send issues and pull requests to the Metamath Zero repository. Thanks for watching.